edition of the Contractor's Secret Weapon Weekly Podcast with your hosts, Dave Negri. This program is dedicated to helping contractors, remodelers, painters, roofers, roof cleaners, and business owners in the construction industry gain an unfair advantage over the competition. This program supplies you with information that the competition doesn't even know exists. This session brought to you by ContractorsSecretWeapon.com. Before we get into the conversation with you, I just want to do a shout out to our sponsors who help uh, promote uh, Contractor Secret Weapon and just some of the things that they have in store for you, our listeners. Hey, is your phone ringing enough? Do you want it to ring more with highly motivated and qualified buyers that contact you, the contractor, directly? No more waiting for the phone to ring. Just answer that phone. Best Home Services leads are dedicated to making your phone ring with motivated buyers that call you directly. There's no obligation to talk with them. Just go to ContractorSecretWeapon.com forward slash money. Fill out the form to secure your discount on the setup fee. Do it today. This special will not last forever. Check them out at ContractorSecretWeapon.com forward slash money. Running a small business is no easy task, and I should know because I had a service company for almost 10 years. I am the founder of a software called Radius Bomb, and it's unbelievable. And for all the listeners of Contractor Secret Weapon, we have a special offer for you to check out. If you want to send hyper-targeted, laser-focused, super-personalized postcards to your exact prospects using a map while sitting in your underwear, then go to ContractorSecretWeapon.com forward slash Radius Bomb, and we'll give you your first hundred postcards for free. Just go to ContractorSecretWeapon.com forward slash Radius Bomb. Hey, this is Dave Negri with Contractor Secret Weapon. I'm just excited to have you here today to listen, uh, to help grow your business. I have this super fantastic guest, Peter Mihit. He's the owner of Custom Business Planning and Solutions, uh, Business Visualizations and Planning Authority. He is co-author of Killer Business Plan. Peter's biggest strengths are in that he can quickly visualize business concepts and distill them down to a set of strategies and tactics that can be acted upon. He used his abilities in the creation of over 500 business plans that have raised over $138 million and direct startups of dozens of companies and the analysis and improvement of scores of business. And he loves small business, and you'll hear him go through, as he says, small businesses are the heroes his heroes because they create uh they make up the economy so let's welcome peter we're going to have a lot of fun and uh you'll he's got three key elements that we're going to go through today and uh take him down and listen to the end he's got some awesome uh things for our guest today peter i am just so glad that you're with us today to talk about uh, business and uh, the business planning and um, so just before we get started, how did you get involved in this business? Well, about 14 years ago, I used to work for Computer Sciences Corporation. And if it's an old reference, but I still got to use it because it's the most accurate. If you saw that movie, Castaway, that was my job. I used to fly all around the world and fix businesses that didn't work. And I also got involved in, in doing high-value outsourcing and that kind of stuff. So I was traveling all over the world, and one day my wife said to me, quit your job. I'm tired of you being gone. <laughs> and I believed her, and yeah. I quit my job. We started this business, which um, is about 65% oriented toward uh, brick-and-mortar, uh, mom-and-pop businesses, contractors, general contractors, um, pool cleaners, all kinds of different stuff. And then on the other end, we actually work with venture capital companies that are finding new cures for cancer and new ways to use um, – uh, create new batteries and different kinds of stuff like that. So we've got a pretty big range of clients, yeah. but we cut our teeth on everyday working people because if you go to our website and you look at it, the first thing you'll see is we think the people who start businesses in America are heroes, they support the economy. They're the biggest employers in the economy. They're the first to hire, the last to fire, most reliable employers, much more reliable than any major corporations. And I escaped the corporate world 14 years ago, and I'm useless as an employee now, and my mission is to make other people useless as employees. I hear you. I always tell everybody I am unemployable. Yeah, I am. It's it's over for me now. Yeah, and uh, 
I and I was unemployable when I worked for somebody. That's why I didn't last. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there's I, that, isn't there? Yeah. But that was goodness. That was uh, thirty years ago, thirty-five years ago. Oh wow, you're doing better than me. You you, yeah. you double my time. Yeah, it was just you know once I started and uh, it was just crazy. It's and I and I and it, it's a different you know. A lot of people say, well. Why would you go into business? It's it's a lot of stress. I said, yeah, but the stress is so much more different. It's a positive stress compared to working for somebody else. Well, and the thing about it is, when you work in a bit, when you work for somebody else, you're only as good as the sales department. You're only as right. good as the CEO. You're only as good. So you can do tremendous work and have it all count for nothing, because the people above you in the superstructure or the management of that company suck at their jobs they just don't know what they're doing and i've had that experience so many times in my working career that when i finally got on my own it's like it's different because now when i suck i know it but i fix it yeah and when you're in the other situation you could know it and not be able to do anything about it right I yeah mean, i had a big conversation with uh, uh my nephew he works for a um i can't say the name cable company and uh, they got bought out, and so a lot of the stuff that they're using, they're training, he's in the training farm, training is, he said it's useless because it doesn't apply to where we are, the stuff we use. And he says, I just throw it away and go back to the old stuff. You know, he says, everyone's getting trained, but, you know, because they don't know. That's right. And there's, and the thing about it is, is when you're in it on your own or you're in a small business or you've got a small group of people and you're all pushing the same direction, people take responsibility. I mean, the difference between an owner and an employee is really easy and it's really simple. An employee's goal is to get to five o'clock and not get noticed and do as little as possible, most of them. <laughs> yeah. And the owner's duty is how much can I get done with the 24 hours God gave me? And those are two diametrically opposed things. So if you're a person who gets upset when the company if you if you're listening to this podcast right now and you've got a job and you're upset when things don't get done or when bad management decisions are made or you get a crap uh, employee review when you knew you did better then you need to be on your own. It, it, it that that's going to cause you more stress. Uh, my health suffered when I worked for other companies. Oh, I know. My health is so much better now, and I'm much older now. My, my health is so much better now than it was 20 years ago because all the stressors are of my own making, and I can control most of them. Right. And the ones that I can't control are easy to accept because I see that I can't control them. So, right. It's a different story altogether. Different, Instead yeah. Instead of being in a position where you can't control nothing. Yeah, you're in the back of the bus. Yeah, yeah. Stop, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna drive you off the cliff, and you just got to watch. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, it sounds like it's been a real fun experience. I, I understand the – I mean, I never traveled as much as you did, but I traveled, you know, for a year for a company, and uh, and I had a, a management job in town, and I and they, they had me travel, and they expect me to do two jobs. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I ended, up, I ended up getting fired. Well, you know, and that's the minimum now, two jobs. It's like my poor daughter, she's working oh, for a company up in San Francisco, and I look at the stuff that she's got to do, and it's like four jobs worth of work now. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. It is crazy. And, and so there's, there's a lot of stuff lacking there. Yeah. In so many ways. Well, I mean, come on. It's like it's the whole concept of they want to talk about lean, man, lean and agile and being quick and all this other stuff. That, in a lot of ways, I mean, when it's applied properly, it means something, but most of the time it means management doesn't want to invest in systems or processes. They just want everybody to kind of figure it out and a, a miracle will occur and things will happen, oh, and it yeah. just doesn't work. It really doesn't for the most part. So I, I know. I, I remember you know, one of the companies that I worked for, they're in, in, and I was in management, and their philosophy was, if you can't train and fire them. <laughs> and I'll go, wait a second. That is the most stupidest thing in the world. And they go, what do you mean? I said, do you understand how much money it costs you to do that? Yeah, that's right. We never figured it out. Well, and we don't care. If, you, if, they, if they can't do the job in X amount of time, fire them. 
<laughs> then go find somebody who el- who oh, also cool. can't do the job. Right. Yeah. And I yeah. and I said, yeah, but I'm at the brunt end of this because if I can't if I can't train them right, then I got to go do the job and I'm not doing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then people said, Dave, we have to talk to you about your attitude. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's where you, that's the next place. Or, it moves, or, or, right. You're just they, not with us. Yeah. Or they brought me up to the the corporate headquarters and they go, uh, we we would we're thinking about moving you up, and I go. To where? To upper management. And I go, well, what's it include? Oh, you're going to have to move. I said, you're crazy. <laughs> and they go, what do you mean? I said, listen, I just moved to Florida because I wanted to move to Florida. I don't want to move nowhere else. And matter of fact, I told my boss that this is a futile trip. He said, but you're going. I said, so that's why I'm here. He said, I had to come. I'm here, but I am not your candidate. Oh, my God. But you're going. I like that. So not even a semblance of a choice. It's kind of like, so why did you fly me up? You could tell me that I don't have a choice without traveling here. I, I tried. I tried my darndest. Matter of fact, I didn't fly. I had to drive. Oh, my God. And my car broke down, so I made him fix it. Well, at least you got something out of the deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't, they, they scratched their heads, you know. Why? You know, it's, well... You know, it's just one of those crazy things. So let's talk about the fun stuff of business owners and how we become better at what we do with the limited amount of space that most of us work in. And that's time space, office space. Because most of us really start off in a truck. That's true. And we've worked with a lot of people who started. In fact, I started out in a truck. Way back in the beginning of my career, I worked in Petrochem. And I was, a, I was an estimator and a project manager, and I ran a lot of jobs out of a pickup truck cap. Truck cap. Wow. And the things that I learned about business then apply now and I think are particularly useful for people who are like home contractors, painters. Um, I can tell you that I mentored a bunch of welders when I was coming up, and it was hard because I was in my 20s, and they were in their 40s, and they go, what do you know about anything until it actually proved out that it worked? Right. And the, th- and the three things – that you got to focus on because we wrote a book called Killer Business Plan. You can go get it on Amazon and it's all about how to figure out what business to pick or, 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 and also then how that, whether that business is going to make money and then what kind of business plan you need to write if you're going to get investors and stuff like that. But that's not what guys and women who are out in the street or in a small shop really need when they're first starting. They really only need to focus on three things. The first thing is who's the customer? Who buys your stuff? The second thing is, how do I attract them? And then the third thing is, how do I keep track of the money? Those are the three things. If you don't focus on anything else but those three things, your odds of success go from being nil to about 80%. And I can can tell you that when we get startup businesses and we teach a lot of classes for – SBDCs and for women's centers and for people that are coming in for free advice, we tell them the same thing because they come in and going, oh, do, do I need to make an LLC or what do I need about, it, about insurance? Those are all important questions, but they're not the most important question because if you set up the perfect business and nobody buys your stuff, then you are what they call in the, um, the, uh, the technical term is screwed. You are screwed. Okay. I, I tell everybody it's an entity. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. now, now. The first thing is the customer. So everybody has got, just like hitting a note on a piano, everybody's got a natural customer that that matches their vibration that will buy from them just because they see themselves in you as a person, right? Oh, I never heard that one before. That's good. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, because everybody goes, well, what do people do? You go, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a printer. Oh, well, who could, who's your customer? Everybody. Yeah. Everybody no. needs printer. No. No. Everybody – and anybody means you sell to nobody because people have to see themselves in what you're selling to be able to want to buy from you. So it's like, for example, somebody that's got a high-end house and spotless floors that you could eat maple nut, walnut ice cream off the floors. You drive up in your beater 67 Chevy truck. You may, be a, you may be a, a perfect painter you may be as yeah. good as anybody but the minute you roll into their driveway you're done mm-hmm. oh i agree be- because it's about image right so you got to understand for that customer you need to be rolling up in a brand new gmc denali 
with all brand new equipment, no scratches on your truck, and you're perfectly dressed and you look good. I mean, like, for example, in California, there's a plumber called Mike Diamond. And Mike Diamond spent millions of dollars on radio saying, my plumbers smell good. No, that was it. That's now, it. Mike Diamond, I've actually done business with Mike Diamond, not the greatest business in the world, but his plumber did actually smell okay <laughs> because – most plumbers that show up, right, they come from job to job to job. Yeah. They're on the fifth job of the day. They don't really smell very good, and they don't really look really very good. And these guys carry changes of clothes in the truck so nice. they can be more presentable, right? Yeah. So now you go buy their stuff, and they're about three times more expensive than anybody else on the market. But, they smell but, if, good. but if that's important to you, yeah. you'll pay because everything, everything comes down to value whether it's real value or perceived value. And so many people don't understand what that word means. Right. It means what in that thing do you see that ring, resonates with you and says, wow, that's worth me paying X amount of dollars for. Yeah. It's not any harder or, or, or more difficult than that. The problem about it is it's different from person to person to person. And so that's why you've got to identify who your root is client is who's the person that is going to buy you and when you first start a business you don't know you can think you know right. but you don't know until when you get experience when you get up to about 10 20 30 clients patterns will start to emerge and then you'll be able to focus and go okay these are these are my people and then you start looking for just like in music harmonics of those yeah. people and you go after them so that's the customer yeah. part, and and it's the most important part. If you can't if you can't tell me, in one or two cent, like for example, if you ask me who my cl my customers are, they are primarily women between the ages of thirty four and forty eight, because that's the biggest demographic starting businesses in America right now. Really? Yeah, I was stunned too when I learned it a couple well, years ago. You know, a couple years ago, they were the uh, number one home buyers, uh, first time home buyers in America too. That's right. Yeah. It's a very action-oriented group. Okay, so we're like Cusp Millennial, Gen X is our main market. Okay. But then we also have a harmonic market of very young millennials that are going, screw college. I see all these people with college debt. I'm not going to take it on. I'm going to start a business. We have a big cohort of them. Wow. And then we have a big cohort of people. But the thing that they have in common is they're very thoughtful people. They want to, they want to really – count the cost before they start. Yeah. They want to measure before they cut. And so they're amenable to planning and thinking things through. That's the number one thing. And then they tend to be um, kind of more forward thinking in terms of they come up with some really super creative ideas. So, oh. so they come in and, and, and bounce them off us. So, so the customer is the first thing. Then the second thing is really an offshoot of the customer. And that is how are you going to market to them? How are you going to find them? Where are they? Mm -hmm. What are they like? What do they do? And it's not just – because here's the thing that, that happens to, um, to, to most people starting a business, especially if they're doing it out of their, the, the cab of their truck. They're relying on word of mouth mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. And then they go, okay, word of mouth is like the slowest way to build a business. So I'm getting hungry, so I'm going to go to talk to somebody about social media. So they go to somebody that talks to social media and they'll go, oh, yeah, you need to do Facebook ads and Instagram pictures and you need to do all these things, show all your work and you need a website and all this other stuff. These are tactics. If your number one group of people that, that are in your business are millennials, they're going to respond to a different kind of media than Gen X is going to respond to. Then the baby boomers are going to respond to, then the greatest generation is going to respond to. And that's why that customer identification in the beginning is so important. Because when you go talk to somebody who sells social media, they're gonna they're gonna wow you. You're gonna think, oh, this is it, but they're there to sell you social media. They're not right. there to sell you how to get clients. Right. And so it's yeah. go ahead, you go. Yeah, it's the same thing with everyone else that walks in your door that wants to sell you advertising. You know, yeah. You know you got to do it, so you take the first guy in, and uh, he's his job is to sell you advertising, not to get you business. David, you are so right. It's, that is is exactly the point. Yeah. It's it, it's so many people. The last person they talk to is the smartest person they've ever met, yeah. and so you got to take a little more time to understand. And the thing about it is, 
I cannot tell you how many people don't do this. If you're listening to this podcast, then you're graced with somebody who buys what you sell. Always ask the question, how did you find me? Right. I, I am so blown away by how many people don't do that. They don't take the time to go, how did you find me? And then it, and, and the, I would actually tell people, like for example, say you're, uh, say you're a carpenter and you're just starting out. Drive two towns over to somewhere where you won't be a competition for somebody and start talking to people who own carpentry businesses. They'll talk to you because business owners are lonely people because yeah. work, working people can't relate to them. Right. And go talk to them and ask them how they do marketing and they're going to ask you questions back and guess what? You're going to start forming a circle of people that you can talk to. I know all of my competition. I talk to all of them. And and just what are you doing? What are we doing? Because the truth of the matter is, if you're out of a pickup truck cab or a thousand square foot office or a two thousand square foot shop, you are not going to dominate the world market in whatever it is you're doing. Right. So you need to cooperate instead of compete. And because it's like when you're at the GE level and at the Apple level, yeah, these guys are really they're waging war, but they have to because. They're making tiny, tiny margins on a lot of stuff. Yeah. But you and your truck or your shop, you should have sufficient margins that you know if, if you don't get every sale, you'll be okay. Talk to other business owners, and they are going to tell you what, what works and what doesn't work. Right, and they will. And, and, and one of the things that I, I love, because I, I really have loved marketing for a long time, and I will always look outside the industry yeah. to find out what's working and emulate that. Because most of the time, stuff that's in your own industry, none of it works. And everyone's copying it. That's also true. That's a very good point. Yeah. It's like it's like it's like. Does Yelp work? I don't know. I don't know. It depends. Yeah, it, everything depends on, on a lot of things. Yeah. I remember listening to a, a mastermind call once, and it just floored me on the different. And that's why I love masterminds. Is uh, there was a bunch of different business owners in the mastermind. There was a baker. There was a, a car salesman. There was a bunch of other people, and and they were talking about different things. And the baker got this brainstorm idea from the used car salesman about trade-ins. Uh, how would you trade in at a bakery? You trade in your old loaf of bread for one of our new ones. Really? Yes. And the guy That's did, a great idea. And the guy did a killer business. I mean, it was just something different. And all his customers were coming in. They didn't buy bread. Hey, you know, bring in. An old loaf of bread or a half a loaf of bread or a bag of bread will trade you for one of our loaves of bread. That is – that's pretty cool. I got to figure out how to use that. But see, that's exactly one of the things I wanted to get to is how do you make yourself different right. so that you stand out? Like for example, in the last 18 months, we've helped uh, plan and helped uh, 14 different apps – Mobile apps get funded. Oh, cool. <laughs> and, and when we were in the beginning of doing this mobile app stuff, we weren't as sophisticated as we are now. And what I tell people who want to do mobile apps is go to Google Play and the App Store. Go to your category, which I call the Avenue of Broken Dreams, <laughs> and look at how many hundreds of apps are out there. Yeah. And how are you going to differentiate off of them to make yourself stand out sufficiently that people – will buy because there's so much now of this if you build it they will come mindset yeah. especially in the digital field in in the internet and apps and and social media and that's just not the case it's like i literally sat in a sales meeting with a client and i told this client not to hire this company i sat in a meeting with this client where the guy said well we're going to create these videos and at least one of them will go viral uh, now how, how at do you least how do you predict that that something's going to go viral? Yeah, you don't. You, you don't. I, you, you don't. And it and it's all it's all, all it's all just total chance and luck and somebody who's connected with a lot of people like your stuff, so it gets a floor and it moves out. And there's a whole science that you can study in a document that was written 50 years ago called Elements of Diffusion. I'll tell you how viral works. And it doesn't have anything to do with anybody being able to plan it to be that way. No, that's why it's called viral. <laughs> that's right. Thank you. And so it, it, it's it's crazy. And so I think the, the the to kind of button that whole thing we've been talking up, button it up. It's that 
You have to decide what you think is going to work. Test it. Yeah. If it doesn't work, come up with another decision. Test it. And keep doing that until it works. And the problem with new business owners or small business owners is they go, I'm doing the work. Isn't it enough that I'm doing the work? Well, if you don't have work to do, you're going to be in trouble. So you got to be able to do that. Yeah. One of my philosophies has always been, you know, do more than one thing. I mean, do one more than marketing piece or one area. Um, Yeah. Because um, my philosophy always is uh, fail fast and move forward. Fail fast and fail forward is yeah. a is an interesting is an interesting viewpoint. My take on it is it costs psychic and emotional energy to fail. Yeah. So I think that the testing and doing yeah. it yeah. piece by piece breaks the failure down small enough that you can swallow it. Right. It's yeah. like it's, it's like when you drop drop twenty five thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars, and I've seen small businesses actually do this thirty thousand dollars into a, a social media campaign Ouch. that produces no results, it's the end of the business. People are, are psychically blown out because now they're going, What is the next test gonna be another thirty thousand wow, dollars? And I t- I took this crazy. Uh, I took a line of credit on my house to finance this and it didn't work and yeah. Well, they got sold a real bill of goods because if you can't figure out if if uh if a, a social media ad is going to work with fifty bucks or hundred bucks, that's your stop point. Yeah, but see, that's the thing. You're talking about it. I'm taking responsibility. I'm writing the ad or getting help with the ad. I'm placing the ad. I'm setting up the Facebook or Instagram metrics. I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm watching them back as opposed to, hey, somebody's going to work for uh, six months because all these ad firms want yeah, six, month six months. Six months, and it's going to cost this much money, and they propose all these results, and they get in and go, well, you know, nobody really knows. Well, so like sorry hiring, about your experience. Yeah, that's like hiring a broker to invest your money. That's why they're called brokers because that's what they do, keep you broke. <laughs> <laughs> they make you broke. <laughs> they take your money. They're magicians. Yeah. They take your money and they make it disappear. Yeah. So now the third thing is you got to track the money. Yes. you got to track the money. And, and my thinking has so evolved on this. When I started, I thought, well, no, you need to have QuickBooks. And you you know if you're not any good at it, you need to have – uh, you need to have like somebody, a bookkeeper or somebody come do your stuff. It, it's not that way. When you're first starting out, when you're first doing this, or if you're in a small business, you may not have that extra three or $400 a month it costs for a bookkeeper. And you may not have the time or patience to learn QuickBooks because, frankly, no one should ever have to learn QuickBooks. But that's I another agree thing. with that. Okay, so now – but you can, and this is what I used to do with welders back in the day before people even had PCs. Mm. Go down and get a three-ring binder that's divided up either in three tabs or five tabs. Those college rule books that are by subject, right? And then in the first, on the first tab is your, you write the word revenue. And that revenue is you just record everywhere where money came in. And then the next tab is expenses. And then if you have expenses that, like, say you're a, uh, you're a carpenter, you have one tab that says job expenses, right. and then the next tab says just expenses that are expenses for running the business. And then you just write down, as you spend stuff, you, your notebook's with you all the time. As you spend stuff, you just put the date, what it was, and how much it cost. And then at the end of the week, you total up those amounts, and you take a, you take a separate piece of paper in the fourth tab, and you take, here's the revenue – Here's what it cost me to do the job. Here's what my expenses were. You subtract the two, the expenses and the job costs from the revenue, and you see whether you made money or not. Right. And then what happens is people, if people do this for a month, their curiosity about why they did or did not make money makes them start to pay more closely, more close attention to the numbers. And then they're going to grow and learn and graduate into some kind of real accounting system on their own. But what most people do is they go, I have money in my checkbook, therefore I'm doing great. Yeah. And yeah, right. it, yeah. it doesn't work. And so yeah. I'm just saying, you know, if you don't, it, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you have to commit to being like full on, I got a full on QuickBooks, I got a full on. Yeah. Get, get yourself a five subject college notebook spiral binder. And it, it, it's like if you can teach yourself that discipline, what you've done is you've taught yourself the discipline of keeping track of all the transactions that have anything to do with your business. And now you have a prayer of understanding if you're making money on the job or not. 
And especially with jobs where you buy materials and the customer changes it up and says, you know, that molding, could you get the one that has the two little dimples in it instead of the one dimple? And you go, yeah, you go down to Home Depot and you buy that molding and it's 25 cents more. But there's 300 linear feet of it. Now you've just added some cost to yeah. the job that you're not going to get paid for. Not so that only you, include you going back and forth to Home Depot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll track your travel too, yeah. right? So, oh, yeah. so now you look at all this stuff. What happened with these welders is they started – they would only check it up at the end of the month and they'd go, dang, I lost money. And then the next thing you know, they were doing it every week. Yeah. And then they were squaring it out every day. Cool. And when they squaring it out every day, then they start understanding what are the real cost drivers in the business, right? Mm-hmm. Like with welders, the big thing that costs them money is gas to drive their heavy trucks to the job, welding rod, yeah. and any gases that they may need, Right. Those are the big costs, and, and plus the gas for their, their weld. All the consumables were the things that determined whether they made a profit or not. And it, when they started their businesses, they didn't think, oh, yeah, that doesn't cost that much for rod. Gas isn't that expensive. That's a, and then they looked at it, and they go, hey, I burned a bunch of rod, and I only burned it halfway because it's harder to burn the rod down at the second half, so I threw that other half of the sticks away. The oh. welders think, well, no, what I mean, because they've done it. Yeah. And they throw the rod away because it's harder to work with. And then they go, no, I'm going to burn that thing down until my hand's hot because you know what? If I burn that down, I just made another five bucks. Yeah, yeah. It's so crazy, it? it's that kind of track. See, because the thing about it is the people who have become great, the people who become millionaires, the people who become wealthy in any kind of business know their numbers. Say that they again. Know, Say that again. They know their numbers. Yeah. And the thing about it is it's a, it's, it's, they know their sales number. Oh, by the way, here's a good number to know. How much does it cost me to make a sale? Yeah. Because if, if it costs me $200 to sell a $100 product, I don't have a business. I have a charity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I these know. are the things I – these are the three things. If you can do this, if your intellectual curiosity doesn't turn you on like a light bulb to the point where you go, I have to get more professional about this, then you are an employee and you need to go back to a job. I think that's awesome. Awesome uh, breakdown of the money situation is the, like you went through. I think that is awesome. I I did a podcast well, a long, long time ago. You know, what does it cost you to get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> that's a good one, actually. Because a lot of guys they just get up, go to work, and they and they go and they'll bid a job and they'll bid a job based on what everyone else in the marketplace is doing, and and that's because they did their research. Well, Bob's doing, you know. Uh, you know, paying uh, two thousand square foot house for fifteen hundred dollars. Johnny's paying a fifteen hundred square foot house for eighteen hundred dollars. Uh, but it actually co- it should be around twenty five hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You That's know? right. Because all the people who start on the cap. Here's the thing: if you go back to value, value, you will never ever bid jobs wrong. Right. Okay. You can't. Price must liquidate cost. Price has to take out cost. If price doesn't take out cost, you're not in business. I don't know what it is you're in, but you're not in business. Yeah. So if there's a problem with Rudy's bidding $1,800 to do a 2,500-square-foot house, Jim's bidding $2,500 to do a 2,500-square-foot house, and you sit down and figure out the cost is $2,750, then you have to figure out the messaging to talk to your client to right. say – these prices sound low. I mean, like, for example, when we do business plans for people, we are not inexpensive, okay? They can run anywhere from $2,500 to $7,500 to the, the most we've ever been paid for a plan was uh, f- about $55,000, right. okay? So they're not inexpensive, all right? But the thing that I can do is I can take you through and say, oh, you can get a business plan online for 500 bucks, but you're going to do all the work and they're going to ask you a bunch of questions you don't know the answers to right. and you're just going to spin around and waste dozens and dozens and hundreds of hours with it. You can buy Business Plan Pro and they're still going to ask you questions that you don't know the answer to because what we do is not just give you a plan. We give you an education. Yeah. We challenge your assumptions and we make sure that you're ready to stand on your own two feet and let's face it, 
face the risk of starting the business because everything's got to be about taking that risk down and making it as small as possible. Absolutely. And so value, you've got to go back to that. It's like, why are we better? How are we better? Why is this? Why is it worth this higher price? And the other thing too is, and it does miracles, is stand behind your work. If something's wrong, make it right. Yeah. Don't hide from customers. Don't make it hard for them to get to you. Well, if make, you're priced right, there's enough profit in there to take care of that. You don't have to run and hide. Exactly. But how many people have you do you know about, especially people that are starting up a small business, solopreneur kind of people, yeah. that it's like, hey, I got to be out in Nutley painting this house. I can't be over here. Because this person, this is the third time I've come back, come back because the paint match is not right. But you go back the third time, you finally get that paint match right. That person is going to be grateful because nobody else in your competition would do that. do that. Right. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah, I agree. This has really been awesome. Uh, this has really, really been awesome. It's, it's oh, it's been fun. Yeah, it is. And I love the part of making it simple for people to, to do as far as tracking their stuff. And, I, and like you said, your welders, they did it on they got it to a point where they're doing it daily. And there's a lot of guys that they need to figure out what they need to do daily, uh, you know, what they need to make daily profit. So just figure out those numbers, figure out what does it cost you, you know, to, uh, to be in business uh, each and every day. And, oh, and, and one last thing. One yeah, last thing. And this is really, really important. I don't want to lose sight of this. I cannot tell you this has happened at least a dozen times in 14 years. People come into our office and they say, my business makes more than a million dollars top line and I cannot pay my mortgage. Because when they designed the business, they didn't figure in what their life costs. So when you're figuring out all the expenses of your business and all the things that it's going to take to run that business – What's the cost of your life, your car payment, your house payment, your yeah. rent, yeah. your kids' braces, everything that's gotta, that you've got to come up with and be responsible for, that gets loaded on the business too if you have a lifestyle business. It's loaded onto that. And too many people don't do that. And then they go, wow, the business is doing really great. How come I'm broke? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm working I, my butt off, right? Yeah, and do that at the beginning or as close as you can to the beginning so you can tweak and pivot and turn and do what you got to do to get the price in to cover the cost so it flows down to the bottom line. So, hey, I can take a weekend off. Hey, I can buy a boat if I want. You know, something yeah, – yeah. you can do something for yourself because if you never get to the point where you can do something for yourself, you'll quit. Well, that's it. And, and I think that we, we've been programmed – too many business people have been programmed from their – uh, employee days that they have to work 40 hours a week, they have to work 50 hours a week. You have you to have work that much if you can't make the revenue. So what do you want the revenue to be and how many hours do you want to work? You know, and it's really interesting too, some about pricing. Pricing can set you free, right? Like for example, yeah. I can't really talk about who the client is because I've got like – 3,000 tons of NDAs on me. Yeah, but the, yeah. guy, the guy came to me. He's a billionaire. The guy's a billionaire. If I said the guy's name, some of your audience would know him. And he says, I want to start 12 businesses, and I need – they're not full business plans. They're treatments. So basically, it's kind of like what's the revenue model? Uh -huh. Who's the customer? What's the market conditions? And then what's my raise to start these 12 businesses? And, he, and, and, he, and I took the business as 12 business plans under one price. Okay. And I said, and I sat down and figured out what it was, and I sat, and I figured out what it was worth to him, and so I bid it at a much bigger price than I probably would have bid it to a regular retail customer, yeah. but he expected to pay a higher price anyway. Yeah. And so now I'm into the fifth one, and the second one ate my lunch. I'm not going to lie, ate my lunch. Okay. okay. But every other one has been wow. I can take Thursday and Friday off this week. Yeah. yeah. How wonderful is that? Yeah. yeah. So you, you got to pay attention to price and cost. The numbers will set you free. Everybody hates them, don't want to do, deal with them. The numbers will set you free. That's where the freedom is. And once you get that and you understand that, nobody can ever take it away from you. You just gave me the uh, title to the podcast. Okay. The numbers will set you free. That's right. <laughs> Think of think of me as Moses in a bathrobe. I'm recovering from the flu as I speak to you, and I'm just I'm standing on top. Of, I'm standing on top of the truck cab. The numbers will set, set you, you free. free. Yeah. There you um, go. With the scrolls, right? 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, this has been awesome. How can how can our listeners get in touch with you? Well, I want to do a couple of things for your listeners because okay, uh, because I think that. Um, uh, like I said, you go to my web website. You guys are the heroes of America. Do not ever, ever think you're not. So first thing is you can go to our website, which is www.custom, word custom, C-U-S-T-O-M, B-P-S, boypaulsam.com. And then you can kind of learn how groovy we are. You can also, and I'm, I'm just going to put this out. If you call 800 741 844 800 I'll do a 15 minute content, uh, consult with anybody on any business problem for absolutely free. And then if they go to our website and they go to our contact page and say, send me the book, I will send you an electronic copy of the book Killer Business Plan, which also has an online component that has models, templates, oh, cool. uh, examples, all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, I want to do this because your people are my people, and I, I want to help them. Excellent. That is awesome. Thanks so much. This has really been fun. Welcome, man. It's been great. Yeah, yeah I, I, really, I really loved it. Cool. All right, so thanks so much, and uh, we'll put all this stuff on our show notes. And Again, I want to thank you for joining us and investing your time with us today. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode, and if you did, go to iTunes and give us a shout-out. You can also go to our website, www.contractorsecretweapon.com, and check out today's episode and leave us a comment in the bottom of the page. And if you haven't gotten your 15 secret weapon strategies to getting higher-end customers, get it while you're at the website. Also, I want to thank again our sponsors for keeping this podcast alive for your profit-making pleasure. And so go be profitable this week. Work smart, not harder, and learn how to leverage your time and your knowledge so that you can be more profitable. Again. See you next week. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Contractor's Secret Weapon Podcast with Dave Negri. We would love to hear your comments about this episode, so visit us online at www.contractorsecretweapon.com and let us hear your thoughts. If you were listening via iTunes, please leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive, the more other contractors will benefit from this show. Thank you, and see you next time here on the Contractor's Secret Weapon Podcast.